Hello and welcome to the program. I am DG Badimasi. Now, last Tuesday, the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abubakar Malami, declared the newly launched security outfit by Southwest Governors, now Operation Amoteku, illegal. The governors had only launched the outfit, which uh, the say seeks to complement the police and other state security operatives in the region when the AGF issued a statement outlawing it. The AGF's position is that Amoteku runs contrary to the provisions of the Nigerian law and that the legal authority over defense is exclusively vested in the hands of the federal government. Now, Malami also said his office was not consulted on the matter, even though the chairman of Nigeria's Governor's Forum, Kayo Defiami, and that's the governor of Ekiti State now, has said security agencies were informed and collaborated with the Southwest in establishing the security outfit. Now, this is still an ongoing debate, and Southwest governors are expected to meet with President Muhammad Buhari on the matter, and quite a number of them have actually said they are going to go to court to challenge the position of the federal government. For now, the big question is, could this be the end of the road for our tech war? How far are Southwest governors willing to go uh, to fight for this? But away from that now, another rave of the moment is the Supreme Court verdict on the Imo State governorship election, which saw the removal of incumbent, at that time incumbent now, Emeka Hedioha from office and the installation of uh, Senator Hope Uzodimma as a duly elected governor. According to initial results released by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Ehedia had polled a total of 273,444 votes, while Uzodimma came fourth, came fourth place now, uh, and actually got uh, 96,458 votes. But the seven-man panel of the Apex Court, led by Chief Justice uh, Tanko Mohammed, unanimously declared that the votes due to Uzodimma from 388 polling units were unlawfully voided by INEC. The court rules that with the results from the 388 polling units added, Uzodimma polled the majority of the lawful votes cast and ought to have been declared the winner of the election. So it's literally a new dawn of governance in Imo State now because uh, of course Senator Hope Uzodimma has since been sworn in as uh, the governor of that state. But joining me now to discuss these two big issues uh, is, uh, well, lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, Chief uh, Robert Clark. Chief, uh, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Let us start with the last issue. Um, yes, let us start with the last issue now. That's the decision of the Supreme Court on the Emo governorship election. Uh, could, could you help us make some sense of it? Because it's actually generating a lot of controversy. Uh, people didn't see this coming. Well, many people did not see it coming because the Supreme Court, in the present circumstances, decided to take over the matter as a court of false sentence. You will remember that in Nokoju's case, the Supreme Court decided in that case that we are all the materials are before the Supreme Court to determine the main cause of action. It could, rather than sending it back to the lower court, sit as a court of first jurisdiction and then determine the issues, if all the facts are before it. In this present case, all the facts are before the Supreme Court. The issue here is this. The presiding officer of INEC, in relation to votes cast in about three, on over 300 words, decided to void all those votes. Now, the issue now came before the tribunal. The petitioner petitioned that INEC's representative or presiding officer had no power to have voided those votes. And those votes, if not voided, will have placed him in a majority position to have been declared the winner of the election. That was his case before the tribunal. It was now discovered by the Supreme Court that this matter was uh, ne never, never appealed in a cross appeal by the, uh, respond by the respondents. Now the Supreme Court said, we can now, as a court of appeal, sit under, I think, Order 22 of the Supreme Court rules 
and educate on this matter ourselves. Since all the facts we need to know to determine this issue are all before us. So the Supreme Court sat as a court of first instance and now claimed that the presiding officer of INEC had no power under the law to have voided all those votes. And therefore, declared that those votes should be restored back to the original owner. And having made that order, and having made the arithmetic, it was discovered that by the restoration of those votes, the total amount cast in favor of uh, Uzodima made him the clear winner with lawful votes in that election. That is what happened. Now you will observe that the Supreme Court made certain remarks and blamed the fact that the lawyers of the PDP never utilized the opportunity given them under the law to have cross appeal. And therefore, they wasted the opportunity of being heard on that matter. So the Supreme Court is laying the blame solely on the, on the you know, side of the lawyers that represented the respondent. That is the position, and it is good law. You cannot fault it. Uh, but I, I have also have to ask you, so, so it's, it's actually the law that uh, presiding officers do not have the powers to uh, void, um, you know, basically void um, uh, uh, res results of uh, elections. Because it's something that we, we've seen in, in the past in this country. Okay, let, let us look at this. At every polling world level, you have agents of all parties there. If the things were not voided at the world level and all parties have signed the form EC8 or whatever, why should now, after they have been you know, collected for collation, it is now at the collation center, the presiding officer who was never there when the votes were being counted and where no objections were made by the officers, party officers, who all signed the papers. Why should they be the one to now void it? And I think the law is very clear on that. Because if the law allows such things to happen, then there will be many, many malpractices. So the law is clear. And of course, it's, it's quite curious that 388 polling units will be, will, will, will be cancelled. That is what happened. And you can imagine that the polling units are, are being you know, stationed and governed by different people. So when you are collecting 300, over 300 polling stations, you are taking into consideration that those polling stations were also manned by over 300 people who have classified those documents as having been validly cast. And both parties' agents have also signed the 386, whatever, the documents. So why should a presiding officer sitting at the collation center now take a decision affecting those words? And I think the law is very clear. And that is why it says, no, you can't do that as a presiding officer. Now, so, some people have raised questions over uh, the, the Supreme Court decision now to to admit those uh, results, the result sheets now, uh, to admit them, uh, because the result sheets were actually tendered by the police. Is there a problem with that? Look, tendering of documents or no tendering of documents, whatever the technicalities at the lower court, no longer, you know, once the Supreme Court says we are now sitting as a court of first instance, you give them that privilege that whatever labels they find, they too will have looked into it. So they are now sitting down, they will have looked into the way and manner the documents were tendered, and they will have been satisfied that everything was done in accordance with the law. Except you find that in discharging that duty, the Supreme Court judges were manifestly wrong, uh, 
or were under a mis misapprehension that created certain... But that is not the case in this matter. Chief... Except you can prove those. Yeah, Chief... I don't think you can fall to the judges. Yeah, Chief... How, how important is it that uh, this was a unanimous judgment by the seven uh, uh, justices of the Supreme Court who sat in this case? Because, you know, it, it's, th there was just no dissension. All seven of them arrived at the same you decision. See, and and, uh, yeah, okay. that, and that, that makes it a better decision. Let me put it that way. If there had been one dissenting judgment, maybe then we will be weighing that one dissenting judgment against the six other majority decisions. But now it's a majority decision. The law is clear. Where there is a panel of five judges sitting at the Supreme Court, three judges out of the five, their decision becomes majority decision and is the judgment of the court. In this case of a seven, because it is a constitutional matter, a seven-man panel of judges will be a, 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 will be giving credence if four of them, out of the seven, give a majority decision. But here we have the whole seven of the panel. What more are you asking for? If there had been one dissenting judgment, then you and I can be looking at the two sides of the coin and see which one is likely to be believed. Just help us, help us to understand this, Chief. Usually when the Supreme Court judges now uh, uh, write their decision, is it, is it that they sit together to, to write the same thing or they basically look at the, the cases on their own individual, uh, you know, from their own individual perspective and then write their judgment before they now sit together to um, probably, you know, uh, on a conference now to, to, to look well, at... Well, I, I can assure you this. I am not a member of the judges of the Court of Appeal. I'm not a member of the judges of the Supreme Court, but from my own experience, I know how the th things work out. When there is a panel of an appeal court, immediately the appeal is heard. Members of the panel fix a date to converge together to discuss the merits and the merits of the appeal. Therefore, after hearing oral evidence, the judges go into chambers and then go and meet at a, a, a decided date to review and then get an agreement among themselves. It is at that stage every one of the judges raises you know, his opinion or disagreement, and all of them now look at it differently from their angles and collectively too. And if they all agree at the end of the day, it is called the unanimous judgment. Maybe one or two of them might have disagreed during that stage of looking into it. But at the stage that there is an agreement of majority members, it becomes the judgment of the Supreme Court. And I believe other members kowtow to that and they call it a majority decision. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. But, but for, for you, how, how, what, what's the implication of this? Well, the implication is this. The Supreme Court judgment is notoriously known as the final of all finals. But under the Supreme Court rules, the Supreme Court believes that they are not infallible, that they are not saints, that they are human beings, and they are susceptible to making mistakes. Therefore, the Supreme Court on its own, in many decided cases, says, look, if we give a judgment, since we are not saints, since we are not angels, you can come back to us. But in coming back to us, the Supreme Court has laid a criteria on the grounds upon which you can come back to them. I have looked at this judgment. You look at the consequential order made. The consequential order, which is that uh, a candidate should step down for a candidate to step in, is made within jurisdiction. If it is out of jurisdiction, then you can now go back to them. That the consequential orders you have made was made out of jurisdiction. Or if the court was functions of issue of the matter, you can go back to them. Or if there is a flagrant miscarriage of justice against public policy, you can go back to them. 
There are many grounds upon which you can go back to the Supreme Court to look at the consequential orders they have made in respect of a given matter. And they will listen to you. This is the norm in Canada, in all Commonwealth countries, in America, in India. And it is practiced in Nigeria. So the fact that the Supreme Court has given a judgment does not necessarily mean that you cannot go back to them. They give you that space to come back. But they tell you that in coming back, these are the grounds we will use in looking at you. But looking at this case, as a lawyer of my own standard, I don't think they fall, they don't fall within the parameter of the reasons why they can go back to the court. Mm. All right, Chief, let, let's, let, let's just take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, I want to talk to you on Amoteko. I want to get your views on the position uh, of the I'm federal government. Yes, so we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. On DG360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the Constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. The Constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete. The clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason why oh. this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that team. Uh, DG 360. Providing clarity to issues.